Oh, I'm uh, doing the mayor and I'm doing a big project uh, for the city of Kansas City, Missouri. With limitless energy, astronaut turned internationally renowned sculptor Ed Dwight meticulously shapes masses of clay into some of the most spectacular artwork in the world with a sense of humor to match. <laughs> Today, Dwight sells more pieces around the world than in the U.S. Australia, Japan, the U.K., France, Switzerland, Norway, just to name a few. Ed started out as an artist. Actually, it was his first love. As a young child of about nine or 10 years old, he would help his grandfather collect scrap metal and then turn it into something beautiful. At the age of two, his mother put him in art classes. I was doing art for, we had a family restaurant and I did all the art for the restaurant and the menus and design and all that kind of stuff when I was, uh, I was 12, 13, 14 years old. But he had his eyes set on the skies, even back then. Our farm butted up against Fairfax Airport. And I had been going to the airport every day since I could walk. As he got older, hunters hired him to clean the planes after a hunting trip. By the time I was a little older, I, you know, I said, well, look, I don't, I don't want to clean these airplanes. I want to fly. By the time he was 9 or 10, he took to the skies, sort of. I started building airplanes out of orange crates. I built a, a neighborhood airplane uh, for, out of Safeway orange crates. And I would take all the neighborhood kids right, uh, flying in my plane. <laughs> I made plane noise. And, until we're over Paris now. <laughs> That's where I got. And people thought I was crazy. Crazy or not, that dream became a reality. He joined the Air Force in 1953. Dwight was working on his master's when one day he received a letter out of the blue at the direction of President John F. Kennedy from the Pentagon asking if he'd like to be an astronaut. Something about, you know, I could then have been the greatest Negro that ever lived. And <laughs> the, the the <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know my answer was even Jackie Robinson. <laughs> but his commander told him they're not ready for you. In other words, you're black. Well, if I do this, I, I, I could get on the cover of Ebony magazine. <laughs> and the guy looked at me and he said, he said, What the hell is Ebony magazine? What does that mean? What does it mean? He put in his application anyway. Three days later, he got a response. And soon, Dwight was on his way to become a test pilot and the first African-American in space. A 29-year-old Negro says he is anxious to go into space. He's Captain Edward Dwight of the Air Force, selected to be an astronaut, the first of his race to be so designated. But then, one of the ugliest moments in our nation's history changed the lives of every American, including Ed Dwight. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, when the president died, you bet, because uh, because the fit hit the sham. Kennedy was dead. Now, President Johnson got to make a decision. Dwight says the government tried to paint him as a national threat. And a dossier had me trying to kill the president. Uh, I was in I was in Arizona. Uh, uh, I mean, I was in uh, New Mexico, in Alba, old town of Albuquerque, standing on a park bench uh, in downtown Albuquerque, in my uniform firing a 45 caliber pistol in the air, saying I was, I was, uh, this is going to, I'm kidding, I'm gonna kill President Johnson. And I was shooting in the air, and the, the way the thing read, that, this, that the local cops just circled the, the thing, they didn't get out of their cars, they circled the, the park, all these police cars, while, you know, while they called the military at the Kirtland Air Base, that's so when the military came out and purportedly arrested me, took the gun away from me, put me in a straitjacket, and I was in a straitjacket for 30 days at Kirtland Hospital, okay? I've been to Kirtland one time in my life, and that was to get some gas in my jet. Story after story. That's why, after 16 years, he decided to leave the Air Force and move to Denver. Eventually, he landed a job with IBM and soon created the art for their offices. <laughs> He left IBM and started a number of companies, including an aviation company, construction company, and a chain of restaurants called The Rib Cage. I had restaurants all over town, girl. <laughs> it wasn't until later in life that Dwight learned about the rich and often brutal African-American history in the U.S. And I got really, really, really upset because all this stuff had gone on while I was living, uh, even while I was the lynchings and all that stuff. and. And I read that and I got really angry. Dwight was so angry and inspired to tell the stories about African Americans through his art that he sold all of his businesses and went back to school at the age of 42. 
and got a master's. Because of my world experience, they put me in charge of the sculpture department at the University of Denver. So I was ran the sculpture department there for three years. I asked him if he ever looks back on his career as a test pilot, having come so close to becoming the first African-American in space, and wonder how he got here to become one of the most sought-after sculptors in the world. Had I not done that, uh, I wouldn't have had the, uh, 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 I, I don't know, or I'll use a good word, fortitude. <laughs> Uh, to do uh, anything approaching this. This extraordinary art. As a young man, Dwight hadn't studied Harriet Tubman or Frederick Douglass. If there was any discrimination, I thought it was because I was short and not because I was black. <laughs> so it wasn't until later uh, when, I, when I really saw the, the depth of it and, and how, da how dastard it was when I started reading all these black history. And I said, oh my God, uh, I mean, something happened before I was born. That's why so much of Dwight's artwork today depicts African Americans and Africans and their contributions to the world. For Art District, I'm Tamara Banks. <laughs>